uh, week, uh, you got an introduction about what machine learning and artificial intelligence is all about. And I think you should just keep in mind three things uh, which are important. One is that algorithms were invented by Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> Two, that the fact that we're in the revolution that we are today in computer sciences is for three reasons. One is amazing algorithms. The other one is that we have computers capable of running enormous amount of data uh, fast. And that was not the case even 10 years ago. So these whole ideas that you're hearing about today are ideas that computer scientists have had for, a lo for some time, 50 years probably, and they weren't able to act on them because they didn't have the powerful computers that we have today. And the third, which is actually also very important, is a f change of thinking in computer sciences from going to the precise answer to a question, like if you want to go to the moon, exactly you need to get those equations accurately, to more or less. And that's very, very important because in the end, in artificial intelligence and machine learning, many times it's not the absolute answer that they're going for, it's more or less. I mean, more or less with a high degree of certainty. So, um, so today I, I would like to again thank uh, the, the titles, the sponsors for this lecture series. All of us can enjoy now not only our lecturers, but also some amazing guitar playing because of the folks that actually pay for the production. And the title uh, sponsors are Tucson Electric Power, Roche, Ventana, UA Research, Discovery, and Innovation. And the underwriters are Accelerate Diagnostics, Arizona Daily Star, Canyon Ranch, Cox Communications, the Galileo Circle, which are those members of our community that strongly support the College of Science. And, and we, they support it by giving enough funds, not only to put together something like this, but to give out more than 70 uh, fellowships and scholarships of more than $1,000 to our students. Uh, Godat Design, Halua Loa Companies, the Marshall Foundation, Wynn Tarbit Patent Law, Raytheon, Research Corporation for Science Advancement, and Tank Launch Arizona. If you could please just help me thank all of these folks. Now we give these lectures out and we connect as many ways as we can with the community because we believe that it's part of the mission of the university and the College of Science. As, as science and technology become more and more complex and more and more abstract, and we're all asked to give opinions about these things, then it's important that we are as educated as we can. We're doing our best to do that, not only through the lecture series, but through science cafes throughout town. Uh, all these lecture series, by, all these lectures, by the way, are on YouTube and, uh, and they're podcasts on our website. If any of you are interested in, in having a little party in your community, let us know and we can maybe help by sending a grad student to answer questions after you listen to, to, to a, a podcast with your friends. There are very many ways that we would like to connect. And of course, in the, in the book festival, the Science City, which was produced really, where's Elliot Shu, my associate dean, has become an, a very important part of science and technology and literacy. But today, let me introduce Mihai Surdenu, the, the second lecturer for this uh, series. He's an associate professor in computer science and a member of the Cognitive Science Graduate Interdisciplinary Program. He's been funded almost continuously by, by DARPA, which is this uh, secret organization from the Defense Department. Uh, it's called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and they're the ones that put cameras and mosquitoes and things like that, so you can do things that you can actually believe. So, uh, and Mihai uh, has been operating with them for some time. He is also uh, has a courtesy appointment with linguistics, so you can see how these computer science are trying to connect with how we think through linguistics and cognitive science in places like Stanford where some of this uh, uh, artificial intelligence began, there's a very strong connection with the Department of Psychology. Um, he has been at Stanford and in industry, he was at Yahoo, uh, it doesn't exist anymore by the way, and, and his most recent startup, which is called Loom.ai, uh, Loom was co-founded with uh, colleagues here at the U of A, and I, I could read what it's about, but I read this five times and I have no clue what he does. So I won't bore you with it. He's leader of uh, various teams at the U of A that are trying to put together an ecosystem of artificial intelligence throughout the university so that we can 
uh, be at the forefront of that discipline. And he's published more than 90 papers uh, in top science uh, publications in the country. He's worked and he has funding in addition from DARPA, from the National Institutes of Health, and from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. So please uh, help me welcome Mihai Sudenu. Good evening, can you hear me? Good, all right, so uh, thank you Dean Reese for the introduction. Uh, I am very excited and humbled to be here and to be honest, a little terrified as well when I look at the room. Uh, so last week, Stefan Koborov did an amazing introduction of the building blocks of artificial intelligence, algorithms and machine learning. This week, we're gonna take a deeper dive into artificial intelligence or AI. Somewhere towards the end of the talk, I will tell you that the scary AI that Stefan mentioned last week won't happen, or it will, but not for the reasons you think. <laughs> but really, what I want to do today is take a look at artificial intelligence and compare it against the human mind so we have a better understanding of what exactly it is, uh, how it compares with us, and where it's going next. Throughout the talk, we're going to look at three distinct intellectual pathways that shaped our understanding of how the human mind works, these are the left uh, boxes that you see on the left-hand side of the slide. And then we're going to take those ideas and see how computer scientists use them to build artificial intelligence. The first direction we're going to look at is the so-called rationalistic tradition, which we can trace back at least to Plato. Plato said that everything that we do as humans is based on a theory of an objective world. These are the platonic ideals that we all heard about. Closer to our times, Descartes and then Husserl said that this theory is implemented in our minds as states and rules for operating over them. So when I was writing this, I was struggling to find an easy example to introduce these ideas until this colleague recommended this cartoon. And this is a fantastic cartoon that I bet was written by a philosopher. And imagine this poor guy on a nice Sunday morning trying to go outside to paint his fence. Before he can do anything, he has to come with labels with complete objective descriptions of the world around him. And this description comes first. First the theory, then painting the fence. This is what the rationalistic tradition is about. Let me give another example. Logic is a perfect example that comes out, out of the rationalistic tradition. And I'll illustrate it, illustrate it here with one of Aristotle's syllogisms. So if I tell anybody in the audience these two sentences, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, you can immediately tell me that Socrates is mortal as well. Right? There are very clear objects in this representation. We have man and Socrates, and they have very clear properties, being mortal in this example. Furthermore, we have mechanisms for chaining these facts and rules to reach a logical conclusion. Let me give you another example. Part of linguistics fits very nicely into the rationalistic tradition. We have objects which are words, like the puppy ate. These objects have properties, just as before. In this case, properties contain linguistic information. Which one is a determiner, which one is a noun, which one is a verb? And then, as rules, we have syntax. As, you know, for any language you speak, you know that, in this case, for English, we know that the puppy sounds better than puppy, the, and so on and so forth. So, clearly, the rationalistic tradition had a major impact on most of the sciences that we have today. Uh, chemistry, astronomy, earth sciences, uh, biology, what else? Physics, linguistics, and cognitive science. Big impact. But does it really explain how the mind works? One major criticism and limitation of the rationalistic tradition is that ob the meaning of an object has to be fixed. A dog is always a dog, regardless of the context in which they appear. If this weren't true, then all the rules for composing meaning would be pointless. Or you would have to have an infinite number of rules to capture all the variations. But being human is all about interpreting context. Let me give an example of that. Suppose you have the word BASS. That can mean a bunch of things. It could be a classical musical instrument, a modern musical instrument, 
a fish, a singer, and so on and so forth. We can keep going. What the simple example is showing is that a key element of what makes us human is having this ability that we instinctively do, which is interpreting context. And this is what the next philosoph philosophy tradition, philosophy direction we're going to look at is all about, being in the world. Being in the world is the work of Martin Heidegger. Heidegger was one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. And his body of work focuses on answering the question, what does it mean to be? Heidegger's prose has been called to have a tortured intensity. And the joke is that Heidegger is untranslatable even in German, his native language. <laughs> because of that, most people don't read Heidegger directly, but they read books about Heidegger. And this is what happened to me. And there are two fundamental works that are very influential. The first one comes from Hubert Dreyfus, who was a philosophy professor at Berkeley. Unfortunately, he passed away last year, whose interpretation of Heidegger was so influential that critics labeled his whole body of work Dreidegger. <laughs> the second one comes from Terry Winograd, who's an artificial re uh, intelligence researcher at Stanford, whose book, Understanding Computers and Cognition, uh, is essentially a computer scientist owed to Heidegger. And I will quote extensively from these two books today. Essentially, what Heidegger is saying is that what we are and what the world is are mutually interdependent. There is no objective world apart from our experiences of it, just as our experiences cannot be separated from the world in which they occur. In other words, I'm going to blow your mind with this animation. Existence is interpretation, and interpretation is existence. OK, this is a very big statement, so let's try to understand it in the next few slides. The fundamental concept of Heidegger is design. And Heidegger labels human beings as design. Design has been translated in English as being in the world, but really it comes from two German words. The first word is da, which means there. The second word is sein, which means being. These two words are important because they essentially encode the two fundamental elements of Heidegger's philosophy. The first one is that being means having the capacity to, for self-interpretation. The second one is that this self-interpretation doesn't happen in a void. It happens in a practical environment in the world, because we are deeply embedded in the world. Even if we wanted, we couldn't extract ourselves from the world. So this concept of design and being in the world, it's kind of hard to relate to, to real life, which is unfortunate, because Heidegger's philosophy was driven by real life. So let me give you a real life example. Suppose you are chairing this large meeting. This is a meeting where controversial issues have to be decided. And you are chairing it, obviously. So, and also, because of the controversial issues that have to be decided, there are extreme opinions in the room. You have to lead the meeting towards a productive goal, because if you don't, then the quality of the discussion will deteriorate and nothing will be achieved. So you have to act. You can't just take a step back and let the meeting progress. You're in charge. You have to act. But the effects of your actions cannot be predicted. Who knows what group one will do when you say something or group two will do? You just don't know. You cannot step back and reflect. You can't just step back for 10 minutes, go outside, think of an objective theory that represents the meaning, and then come back and act. You have to act in the moment. You don't have a, because of that, you don't have a stable representation of the situation. All you have is your best interpretation of the situation, just like everybody else in the room has their own interpretation. And as I just said, every representation, is an, every, every representation is an interpretation. Nobody has the whole objective truth. All they have is their own interpretations. This is exactly what Heidegger is saying with being in the world. Let me give you another example, which is probably better. Who knows what's happening in this room? <laughs> All we know is that we have the interpretation of the donkey and we have the interpretation of the bunny, right? Two subjective interpretations of the same situation. That's funny, but there are deep consequences of Heidegger's work. The first one is that Heidegger rejects that our minds have a, the a complete and objective theory of the world. In other words, there is no neutral viewpoint because we always operate within a framework. The second one, which contradicts again the rationalistic tradition, is that practical understanding is more important than detached, the detached theoretical understanding, which was put on a pedestal by, by Plato and his followers. Lastly, meaning is fundamentally social. 
That's because the environment in which we operate is deeply social. Because of this, Heidegger is arguing that the social interactions, the social framework that surrounds us, is the, ac the, the actual framework for intelligibility. OK, so so far we looked at two traditions, and the second one is beginning to contradict the rationalistic tradition. Whereas the first one is saying that there is a no theory of an objective world, being in the world is saying the opposite. It's all about context and our subjective interpretations of it. It turns out that biology supports being in the world. So for that reason, let's take a look at how the brain actually works as an organ by looking at cognitions, uh, cognition as biology. So for the next couple of slides, I'll show you the work of Umberto Maturana, who's a Chilean biologist whose work focused on trying to understand how biology supports the phenomena of cognition. Before Maturana, the, the traditional understanding in neuroscience was that cognition happens somewhere deep in our neuroanatomy where cognitive constructions and cognitive processing happens. Let me give you an example. Suppose you're, you're looking at this frog, and the frog sees a, a moth. What happens is that the pattern of light caused by the insect flying activates the visual system, and the signal in the visual system gets sent somewhere deep in the neuroanatomy where we have, sorry, advancing too fast, where we have this cognitive construction that insect equals food. As a reaction of that, the insect acts and catches the insect. Uh, the frog acts and catches the insect. What Maturana showed, and this is his fundamental key observation, was that this wasn't true. What he showed was that co there is cognitive activity directly in the visual system. The fundamental consequence of that is that there are no deep cognitive constructions or processing needed for learning. And learning is actually adapting to and learning from patterns observed directly in the environment. This is fundamental because this is actually saying exactly what being in the world is saying. All we have is a subjective interpretation of our environment, and in, in this case, memorize these patterns in the brain. OK, so, so far, and by the way, this is, I'm showing the frog example because frogs came first, came first in neuroscience. But, you know, a little bit later, James Gibson showed that the same holds for the human brain. So, so far, the narrative contradicts the rationalistic tradition. And the last two directions essentially are saying the same thing but coming from different directions. We are now switching to computer science, where we will show that these ideas are mimicked into computer science, but in the beginning, just like philosophy, computer science started firmly in the rationalistic tradition with logic reasoning and pattern matching. Let me give an example of logic reasoning in computer science. Computer science is actually designed very, very well to operate over objects, properties, and logic, because that's exactly what computers do. So I'm going to show you how the Aristotle syllogism is implemented in the prolog computer language, which was designed in the 70s. You can, even if you don't understand computers, you can see how close they are. And prolog has facts, just like the, any objective theory of the world. So we know that Socrates is a man. It has rules. By the way, in prolog, you want to read the rule left to, uh, right to left. So what this rule is saying is that if x is a man, then x is mortal. Just like logic, prolog has a theorem-proving component, which is capable of answering questions, is Socrates mortal with true? Right. Very, very close to what computer science does. Here's another example. In the early 70s, Terry Winograd implemented what he called Bloch's world, which is a visual world in which computers take instructions from humans and operate over these virtual blocks. For example, if the person says, pick up a block, the computer says, OK. Sounds obvious to us, but there's actually deep logic that had to be implemented by Winograd in order to make this work. For example, the computer has to understand what objects are there, what properties they have, color being one property, and also the logic about moving objects. So for example, in order to pick up an object, you have to, you, you're only able to pick it up if there's nothing on top. Another example uh, where there's some ambiguity, pick up the cylinder, and the computer doesn't know because there are two cylinders that can be picked up, right? So what this example is showing is that there is a deep logic that has to be implemented in order to manipulate objects in the blocks world. And this logic came from Winograd. 
he defined the theory, the objective view of Bloch's world, and implemented it in the machine. Let me give another example that comes from our lab. And this is in the biomedical domain. So before I'm showing you the results, I'm going to motivate why we're doing this. These are statistics of the number of publications published in the biomedical field every year. So this, these are not cumulative results. These are results per year. So you see a number of years in the x-axis. And on, on the y-axis, we see the number of publications published in each year. What you see that in just in the past seven years, there have been more than one million biomedical publications published every year. How are we supposed to design a treatment for a disease when there is so much knowledge out there? Clearly, this is much more than what any human being can read. If we agree on that, then clearly the machines must help. So what we did at the University of Arizona, we built such a machine reading system that's extracting fragments of causal models that are relevant in our case for cancer, and it's assembling them into a causal model that explains the disease. In our case, causal models are protein signaling pathways, where proteins send chemi chemical signals to each other, whereas at, where at the end, something happens to the disease. For example, a chain of these chemical signals may end up causing a tumor to grow, which we don't want. So what we did here, we implemented a system that's exposed to many, many hundreds of thousands of publications, and it's taking text in like this. Then it's finding patterns that are indicative of biological structures. And it's building fragments of this type of causal models. Let's read what's constructed at the top, right to left. So we identify entities of interest. We identify that TBC1D1 is a protein. And this protein gets phosphorylated. Phosphorylation means that there's a tiny chemical entity that gets attached to the protein, which made, makes it active in this chain reaction that end, ends up affecting cancer. This phosphorylation process is then controlled by this chemical entity uh, on the, on the left-hand side. So there's, there was a series of patterns that we had to implement. For example, what you see there in red are two negative triggers for a regulation. But when you're combining two negations, you end up with a positive regulation. That's why the regulation is positive. So we had a series of about 150 such patterns that captured the biological language that is relevant for constructing these causal models. OK. So this was funded by a government organization, and they evaluated us and a bunch of other systems along two axes. What you see on the x-axis is throughput, meaning how many papers could the machine read in a given unit of time, approximately two days. So it goes from 0 to 1,000. On the y-axis, we see precision, meaning how many of the, of the interactions, such as the one I showed on the previous slide, are correct or not. Again, it goes from 0, no correct, to 1, which means everything is correct. So we were compared against four systems. Obviously, you want to be in the top right corner, right? You want to have high throughput and high precision. And I'm showing you this chart because that's where we are. Uh, <laughs> what's more interesting is that human domain experts, these are human cancer researchers, are there in the top left. And clearly, humans, human beings don't have a high throughput. How many academic papers can you read a day? My average is at most two before my brain is fried out, right? So clearly, the throughput is not high. What was more interesting in this evaluation was that they found out that human beings actually have slightly lower precision than the machines. That's because reading this type of biological papers is a very long and tedious process, and human beings get tired and they have limited attention span. OK, so now we have a bragging point that we can read much faster and slightly better than humans. But is it actually useful? So let me give you a use case. Uh, the so-called mutual exclusivity uh, problem for cancer. And I'll explain it first without biology, and then we'll move on to biology. Suppose that a burglar wants to get into your house. Now, the burglar can do one of two things. It can go through the door, or it can go through the window. But they don't need to do both. Right? One is sufficient to get your valuables. It turns out that exactly the same phenomenon is happening for cancer. Suppose, in this case, that cancer is the, disease, is the burglar, and why is your va valuable? Why is a protein that say, that's important for controlling for cancer? Suppose why is a, is a protein that controls the prol proliferation of a tumor? So you want Y to be active. Now, the cancer can get through Y through pathway A, let's call it the door, or through pathway B, let's call it the window. 
But the disease doesn't need to get through both. One is sufficient to get to Y and is activated. This is why in patients that have the same disease, such as breast cancer, you get two different mutations in patients having the same problem. Right? Now, clearly, if we want to treat the disease, we have to block both entrances. Just like when you're protecting your house, you have to protect both doors and windows. Now, clearly, if you want to protect your house, you have to understand what are the weak points. And this is what machine reading is helping, is extracting all the causal models that are published, where fragments are published in the literature, but nobody put them together. So I'm going to show some results of how, how this works. So this is a database of uh, interactions that were manually created by cancer researchers. And in, they, they extracted roughly 89,000 interactions, such as the one I showed before. The machine extracted over a million. Even if you look at interactions that are produced in at least two papers to have some reproducibility to filter out junk science, we're still left with over 600,000, roughly an order of magnitude more. What's even more impressive is that human beings worked more than 20, 10 years on curating this database, where the machine ran for two weeks to generate this. Right? Very impressive. But is it useful? We still don't know yet. So I'm going to show some results to prove that it's useful. So I'm going to show you a bunch of boxes, whereas where in each box we have the mutual exclusive pathways that act activate the same downstream protein that cause that's relevant for cancer. So what's important here is that I will highlight in yellow the interactions that are produced by the machine, which were not in the original manual database. Okay? So let's look at the interactions for breast cancer. Look how much yellow there is out there. This is information that the human beings, the human domain experts did not have before we contributed to this, uh, to this effort. To me, this is my mo the most favorite slide of my own research because it demonstrates that what I do has the potential to actually help you know, the quality of human life. These are the results for glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer. Same things. We observed similar results for, five, for seven different cancers in total. We still don't know if this is good, right? This is what the machine proposed as a, as a hypothesis for a mutual exclusive pathway. So in order to check for correctness, we brought in an external biologist who looked at the correctness of these extractions. In other words, we gave the expert access to any literature they wanted to see if the, if our, if the hypothesis proposed by the machine are correct or not. What the expert found was that if you look at all the hypotheses proposed, 65% of them are correct. If we add that uh, redundancy uh, idea of keeping only hypotheses supported by at least two publications, 80% are correct. This is good, but it's not perfect. We still need humans in the loop, right? So next week, Nirav Merchant is going to talk about this type of partnerships that happen between humans and machines. By the way, I'm talking about my own research because I'm selfish. But there's a fantastic artificial intelligence group at the University of Arizona. These are just some of the pictures I remember, so I apologize if I'm forgetting people. And this fantastic group works on fundamental problems such as early detection of autism in medical records or identification of military threats by mining uh, intelligence messages. So really fundamental stuff. So clearly this is useful, right? But is it really human-like intelligence? And Winograd argues that together with Heidegger, is that he argues for context blindness. What that means is that this type of artificial intelligence is for le forever limited to work within the world programmed by the, by the scientist. For example, Winograd's system is very good at moving blocks, but it has no idea how to read cancer papers. And the opposite is true for our system. They cannot move between contexts, whereas us as human beings, we can naturally do this, right? I can drive to work, I can reach work and I can read an academic paper, I can go back home and play with Legos with my kid or play chess with the other kid. We can all do this naturally. AI can do only one of these. So let me give you a real-world example of why that's important. Just, last, uh, just this month, Facebook shut down their chatbot called M because it cost them too much they found out that M can automatically handle only 30% of the questions that came its way. And that's because, unlike Alexa and Siri, which are limited to playing music and adding calendar appointments, 
they open M to the world. In other words, even though AI is designed, it, it was programmed to have a context blindness, they wanted it to operate in the entire world, and it just couldn't do it. So they ended up having to answer 70% of the questions manually, which ended up being too much. So can we do better? And it turns out we can if we look at biology. So neural networks are an approximate implementation of what's happening in our brain. And the main idea is, let's just do what the brain does. We don't really know how it works, but let's just mimic it. So this is not a new idea. In the 50s, Frank Rosenblatt uh, designed the perceptron, which is a mathematical implementation of one neuron. There was a flurry of activity afterwards, and culminating with Ivagnenko, which in the early 60s published the backpropagation algorithm, which tells us how to train a network of neurons. So last week, Stefan uh, defined machine learning as a computer program that learns from examples. I prefer this definition, where we shove in a pile of data into linear algebra, and we keep stirring until the right answers come out. Let me give an example. So let's say we're looking at image processing. We're trying to classify what's in an image. We can feed in a large collection of images to a computer. Through a learning algorithm such as backpropagation, I'll give you an example in one slide how this works, we end up constructing a network. This network is essentially a prediction machine, such that when we expose it to a new image, the machine should be able to say that this is most likely a dog and not a mop. <laughs> OK, so how does backpropagation work, right? It's sort of mystical, but it's actually very simple. So let me exemplify how this works. This is, of course, a toy network. But each network has input neurons, which are correct, connected directly to the data. So for example, in the case of image processing, each of the neurons on the left will be connected to a dot in the image. And then you have output neurons, where you have one neuron for each type of, uh, of image that you want to classify. So there's going to be a neuron for a cat, a neuron for a dog, and so on. Now during training, we're exposing the network to a series of images and we're asking the network to classify each image. Let's say we're classifying the cat, and the network predicts dog, because it's still early in the learning process, so it doesn't know. What the backpropagation algorithm essentially does, it's assigning blame. What I mean by that, it's looking back through the network, hence the name backpropagation, and it's turning down the volume of the neurons that fire too much on the incorrect path. And it's turning up the volume on the neurons that should have fired, but didn't. It's literally a volume knob. That's it. So very, very simple stuff. And we actually had this theory, most of it, in the early 60s. Yet, as, as Dean Ruiz mentioned at the beginning, we didn't see fantastic results with deep learning until approximately 40 years afterwards, because several things had to come together. We needed to have big data. <laughs> uh, Hardware had to catch up, and some theory, some further theory had to be developed. So let me give an example of the first two. So Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, came up with the observation early, you know, early in the 60s that computing power, the, meaning the number of transi transistors on a chip, will double every two years. And this is actually what happened. What you see here is years, and what you see on the y-axis is the number of transistors on a chip in a log scale, meaning each tick is 10 times larger than the previous one. And you see that computing power kept going up. And in fact, it had to go way up until here, because backpropagation is actually an expensive algorithm. It's a simple one, but it takes a lot of matrix multiplications to implement that turning up and down of the uh, synapse volume. So the wonder year for deep learning is around 2012, where a group from University of Toronto showed fantastic results on this image processing task. This is an example of big data. This is a database of 15 million images classified in 22,000 uh, uh, 22, different types. Complicated task. They proposed a very complicated network that had roughly 650,000 neurons. And using this network, they showed fantastic results. They reduced the number of mistakes by one third, from 26% to 17%. These are fantastic results. You almost never see such an improvement in computer science. And this trend of amazing improvements continued with speech processing. Microsoft 
uh, showed in 2016 that they can build a system that turns sounds into words at an accuracy better than what we can do as human beings. There are self-driving cars that we all know about, so in January, Las Vegas introduced a self-driving shuttle on the Strip. In February, Ford announced that they invested $1 billion in self-driving cars. Legislation is catching up, so California and then the House of Representatives passed law to regulate this type of vehicles. And finally, something important, Domino's is going to have a self-driving car for pizza delivery. <laughs> So there, there is tremendous progress with deep learning. And importantly, just like Heidegger said, these systems are learning without an objective theory of the world, but instead they're learning patterns from their environments. They're learning patterns from the data they have. So this is aligning exactly with what biology and Heidegger are saying. But they're still limited. They still have blinders on. They are limited to the data they've been exposed to in training. Let me give you an example that had, I read about only yesterday or two days ago. So last week, a Tesla car on autopilot drove straight into a fire truck that was parked on a highway because of an emergency. And this happened because the environment was a little bit different from what the car saw during training. It just didn't know how to handle it, so it kept driving. <laughs> Let me give another example from my favorite car show. What these guys are saying is that they will buy a self-driving car only when the CEO of the company is willing to stay in the car while it's driving up on a mountain road and reach the top without side effects. <laughs> yeah. They're saying very important things here, right? They're saying that <laughs> we're training things in a very limited context, right? So they know how to drive on highways, but when you put them on death road, they're not going to know what to do. Here's another example. If you feed this image of a panda to an image recognition uh, system, such as the one I showed before, it's classifying it correctly as panda. If you add a little bit of noise to it, the image on, what's that, on the right is still clearly a panda to us, right? But the machine is not classifying as gibbon with 99% confidence. <laughs> what all these examples are saying is that they have context blinders on. Right? They know how to operate when the data matches what they saw in training, but as soon as we change the environment a tiny bit, they don't know what to do. So where are we? If we look at this, you know, this uh, slide here, we immediately see two major problems. Let's start with a smaller one. I said before the neural networks approximate the way the brain works. And I said that because if you look at the human brain, the, what we know now is that the human brain has roughly 86 billion neurons of about uh, 10,000 different types. If you look at a complex neural network, such as the one from the University of Toronto, that one has 600,000 neurons of only about 10 types or less. We're about five orders of magnitude weaker than the human brain today. So we still have to play catch up. But just like Winograd said last year, there is nothing in our brain that isn't physical. So because of that, I am optimistic that artificial intelligence, neural networks, will essentially catch up. I wonder if there's a more law for the growth of neural networks. I suspect there's one out there. So I think in the near future, we will catch up. But there are bigger problems. You see the big empty void in there. We really have no idea how to build AI that is in the world. It doesn't mean we haven't tried. So let me give you two examples. Psyche is a company that was funded in the early 80s. And they tried to use rationalistic tradition to implement the world. What they did was they added hundreds of thousands of facts and rules and logic to manipulate the world. And their facts include information such as Bill Clinton was a US president, all, all trees are plants, and so on and so forth. Uh, Psyche has been called by a famous AI researcher the most notorious failure in the history of AI. The reason for that is that how do you know when you're done? How many rules do you know to model the world? Furthermore, how, what are the rules for sarcasm? <laughs> what are the rules for metaphors? Can you write rules for art? I wish you could. Right? So there are, there are very big questions that are not answerable with approaches such as psych. So let's take the other side. Let's look at neural networks, and let's see how they model the world. So I think the most exciting approach that's going on right now in neural networks is so-called multitask learning, where we use a single network to learn multiple things in parallel. For example, in our lab, 
We use multitask learning to learn at the same time the syntax of English language, what's a subject, what's a verb, and to learn the language of biology, similar to the system I showed before for machine reading. So this is very, very exciting stuff, and it sort of mimics what we do with our brains, but it's still limited. How do we get stimuli? If we're trying to model the world, we're going to have to have stimuli for the whole world. How many stimuli are there for the world? How many tasks do you need to model the world, right? Just think of your typical day. How many things do you do in a single day? A lot. Each one would require a different task. And even more depressingly, there is math work which shows that the larger the network, the more complicated it is to train. So this is not looking good. So I want to give them some credit for tackling a very important problem. But really, we're climbing trees to get to the moon with respect to being in the world. We really don't know how to do it. So that's a major limitation. So let's see where we are. I'm arguing that this is where we are today. So with respect to pattern recognition, I'm arguing that AI is already doing better or will do better than humans very soon. Right? We have AI that plays Go better than people, plays chess better than people, and so on and so forth. But on the side of being in the world, AI has no idea what to do. You see immediately the major differences between us and AI. And there are good news and bad news as a result of this. Let me start with the bad news. So Turing's argument from consciousness still holds. We have no idea how to build AI that, that does good art, because what is art if not our capacity to self-interpret uh, or our capacity to interpret the environment? But AI just doesn't understand the environment in general. The good news is that a scary AI won't happen. I don't think AI will get super smart, because it doesn't even understand how to handle ba two different basic tasks at the same time. Further good news is that AI is not designed to replace us, but to complement us, if you remember the previous slide. Because of this, I prefer much more the term intelligence augmentation than artificial intelligence. It's designed to help us, not to replace us. This is a perfect example of intelligence augmentation, right? The machines can read hundreds of thousands of publications, but they still need the human at the end to hold its hand to understand if this is a good hypothesis or not. Good. So if we're designing intelligence augmentation as a tool, we can focus on the features that we want good tools to have. So I'm going to propose two tools that I think should be, will be implemented in the near future. The first one is interpretability. I think you all know about Watson, the question answering from IBM, question answering system from IBM, who did very well in the Jeopardy trivia game. So if you remember what they did in the game, the output of the system was, I predict the good answer is x with a confidence of 70%. This is fine for a trivia game, and this was an impressive achievement. But would you trust the system when it's deployed in critical decision making if it produced an answer like those without any explanations? <laughs> How about this one? I hope you believe that one. <laughs> But really, we shouldn't be trusting such decisions without an explanation of why they're happening. So intelligence augmentation must explain its decisions. So DARPA, which stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is essentially the research arm of the Army, has caught on. And in 2016, they launched this program called Explainable AI. And their marketing pitch was, this is what's happening today. When in an image classification system, when you run it, it says, this is a cat. But really what you want, it says, this is a cat because it has fur, whiskers, claws, and it has that feature at the bottom. I don't know what it is, but I see a lot in cats. <laughs> right? It, you need to do two things at the same time. You want both, classification and explanation. Let me give you an example from our lab. So we, we have built a question answering system that's tailored for answering scientific questions, such as the one you see there. And what our system is doing is, A, providing the good answer, grass, because of an explanation that it builds together by aggregating knowledge from databases. So obviously, the explanation is that grass is a producer because a producer is usually a green plant, and grass is a green plant. And this explanation has been mined and aggregated automatically by the machine. This is what you want. You want both. So I'm revisiting this idea, and I'm arguing that the scary AI might happen, 
Not because it gets super smart, but because right now what's happening today, we are deploying, deploying complex machine learning systems for critical decisions making, decision making without understanding what they do. There might be bugs in them, and we don't even know there are bugs. Let me give you an example of such a bug. We are very biased as human beings. Just look at any new story today, and everything is biased, right? And the bad news is that machines are picking this bias. Consequently, the feature we want to implement in intelligence augmentation is robustness to such biases. Let me give you some example of biases. Recently, uh, it's been shown that Compass, which is a risk assessment system for people who are arrested, is continuously biased against people of racial minorities. Not good. This is a search I did on Google Images on the term CEO. This was just last Thursday. Count how many women are there. So why is this happening? The cause number one is the typical garbage in, garbage out problem in computer science. Uh, again, machine learning is a computer program and less from examples, but our examples, our training data, comes from the world. And the world that we live in today has systemic gender and racial biases. So the system is picking up on those. Even worse, AI is making it worse than it is. Let me give an example. This, are, this is a paper that was published last year, and what the authors focused on was building a system that understands who does what in an image. What they found out was that certain pictures are biased. In, in, in particular, they looked at cooking, and they found out that two-thirds of the pictures are biased towards women doing the cooking. We knew that. What was fundamental in this paper was that AI emphasizes this bias. If you train a system on this data, it becomes more biased than the original data. This is an example. They classify this image as a woman doing the cooking. This is because the machine learning systems today essentially have a winner-take-all attitude. And because they saw that most of the cooking is done by women, they assume it's a general property. This is bad, right? Not only the data is bad, but the algorithms are bad. The really good news coming from this paper is that this can be fixed. These authors proposed a mathematical formulation in which they control for bias, such that the resulting algorithm is not more biased than the data it, it's trained on. So that's very good news. So what I'm arguing is that this is where we are today, and in the very near future, we'll be here. We will have systems that have the ability to explain themselves, which is better than most of us can do, and we'll have systems that, uh, sorry, that are robust to bias, which again is more than what we can say about us. In a way, what I told you today is not really new. This happens with most of the technologies that have been developed you know, in, in, in our past. For example, if you make the analogy between artificial intelligence and flying, if we are trying to copy the mind, we're going to end up with a flappy thing in the middle that's going nowhere. But if we're learning from the human mind, and we're building something useful, we're going to end up with intelligence augmentation, which is the plane. So yes, we started building artificial intelligence by learning what the mind does, but we ended up in a different place. And this is a useful place. And in order to understand about the opportunities that this place offers us, stay tuned for next week when Niravi is going to discuss this. Thank you.